My nephew stopped by today. He wanted to talk and said it had been forever. But come on, it was the middle of the workday. What's the big deal if it's been two years and he just had a kid? I don't have time to chat. I've got my priorities and I'm sticking to them. So obviously I had no choice but to kick him out of my office. He was corrupting my productivity. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, welcome everyone to My Victory Church. Let's welcome everyone that's joining us online or on Facebook Live, wherever you are around the world. Welcome to all of you. Welcome, Lethbridge. <laughs> We, we are one church in multiple locations. We have campuses in Claire's home. We have a campus in Okotoks. We have a campus in Tabor. We have a campus in Lloyd Minster. We have this one, plus we have all the, the stuff that's going on around the world. We have people that tune in every single weekend online all over the world, and they are as much a part of us as we are who are physically here in this building. So it's amazing. We have family all the world. Technology is amazing, and we, we get to do this, and we get to see the hope that is Jesus and connect people to, to him, which is such an honor and a privilege. And we are in part three of a series we began a couple weeks ago called Pay It Forward. And yes, it is loosely based on the movie under the same title, Pay It Forward, which is a story of a uh, of a young uh, boy who is in junior high, his junior high teacher challenges his class to come up with an idea that would change the world. And the young boy's idea is, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be generous and kind and, and, you know, help somebody that is in need. And instead of expecting them to pay it back to me, I'm going to in, instead encourage them to pay it forward to at least three other people. And if they could, that could happen. And those three people could pay it forward to three others, and those three could pay it forward to three others, we could eventually change the world. And I thought, what, what an amazing concept. And what if, what if we as the church could do the same kind of thing? What if we could unleash an unprecedented amount of generosity on our communities, the five communities that we're in, plus where we reach around the world? What would happen if we could, we could unleash generosity and, and help People, especially coming up to Christmas season, wouldn't this be amazing? Because I don't know if you've noticed, like I've noticed, that the world needs a little bit of help. And I'm not just, you know, this, uh, come on, let's, it's okay to talk back to me in, 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 in the message, this is good. Nobody else, nobody wants to say anything because we, I mean, we say it all privately, don't we? Or we're not privately on Facebook, maybe. Everybody else is crazy. We're not crazy, but everybody else is. Anybody ever, you know, we all think that, and they think the same thing about us. So it's, it's a wonderful, a wonderful time to be alive, and we, we have access to everybody's craziness on, on, you know, in the palm of our hand, in the devices that we carry. And, and it's getting increasingly worse, where people are getting more opinionated than ever. Anybody, nobody else has noticed this. Okay, okay, I'm seeing some nods. Okay. So I'm not alone in this, but I'm thinking if the world is getting darker and darker, shouldn't we as a church who has the hope that is Jesus, the light of the world is what the Bible calls Jesus, shouldn't we do something about it? It's just, just a thought. And it's not just my thought. Jesus, in fact, said to his followers, look at what he said in Matthew chapter 5. He said to his followers, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, how many of you, I mean, this, that's quite a statement, no longer good for anything. How many would, <laughs> we want to still be good for something? Right? I mean, I don't want to be somebody who's no longer good for anything. Amen? I don't want to be that person. No longer good for anything. Jesus says, hey, you want to be salt. Well, what is the purpose of salt? Well, salt has a couple purposes. First purpose is it, it enhances flavor. So he says to the church, he says to his followers, he says the, his, his, the believers in Jesus, he says, you are the salt. In other words, the church, the Christians are supposed to be the one enhancing the flavor of our communities. Another reason, another purpose of salt is salt is great for traction. We put it on our roads 
to create traction. Salt was also used in, in Jesus' time as preservation. They would, and still is today, they'd stuff, you know, meat with salt and it would preserve. So if our mandate as a church is to be like salt, to add flavor, to add traction, to add, you know, to preserve our communities, if the world is getting crazier and crazier, isn't it supposed to be us? He says, he says the responsibility. We look at and saying, well, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and we just look at us and go, they're going crazy and crazy and crazy. There's nothing we can do about it. Actually, Jesus says, actually, you should do something about it. You're the salt. And then he says in the next verse, you're also the light. Because he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, put it on its stand and it it gives light to everyone in the house. Now this this is amazing. Because there's so many, this is a great analogy Jesus used. Because there's so many things that we could, we could pull out of this. See, darkness if the world's getting darkness, darkness has no power in and of itself. And I think a lot of Christians, we get so afraid of darkness. We get so afraid of the world. We get so afraid of the devil. And we, we, we're, you know, we, the devil's doing this. And there's as if there's nothing we can do. Well, Jesus, just, I mean, Jesus used the analogy of saying, you are the light. Now watch this. Darkness has no power in and of itself. Darkness is simply the absence of light, is it not? So if the world is getting darker... Whose responsibility is it to change that? According to Jesus, it's our responsibility because he says, you are the light. If the world's getting darker, instead of pointing the blame and doing what he says not to do, he says, don't put that light under a bowl. Or, in other words, don't just shine a light in your safe little churches. Come on. (laughs) Right, where we can express our, our, our Christianity, we can express our love for God safely undercover. He says, don't be undercover. We can express our love for God. He says, no, no, you're supposed to be the light. You're supposed to turn on the light. And, and where you turn on, where do I turn the light on? Where it's darkest? You with me? We see, we see this? It's our responsibility to be the light, to shine brighter, brighter. So how do we do this? How do we shine? How do we do that? He says in the next verse, in the same way, let your light shine before others that, you, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, do what Jesus did. See, Jesus often did good deeds before he preached. And sometimes as Christians, we need to shut this and use these. Anybody else? Come on. We don't need to tell them what they're doing wrong. We need to show them the love of Jesus like Jesus did. See, Jesus would go and he would feed the hungry. Jesus would go and he'd heal the sick. Jesus would go and he'd he'd attend Zacchaeus' the outcast's house and just saying, I'm coming to your meal and show him honor and respect and validation and didn't preach a word to him. And in that Zacchaeus got saved. So Jesus instructs us to be the light. So that's the reason why we're doing this series. The purpose of this series is what would happen if we could unleash an extraordinary amount of love and generosity in our community? What would happen if we could, we could stop complaining about how the world is going to hell, how the world is getting darker, how it's getting crazier, and stop, and stop withdrawing and, and into our little safe little bubbles? And what would happen if we went into the communities and turned on a light and unleash a, you know, pay it forward and unleash generosity into the community, what would happen? Number one, we'd be doing what Jesus said, but number two, I think we could potentially make a difference so that we are good for something. Amen? Now watch. In this series, we've been talking about generosity. Why generosity? 
Well, Solomon said, you know, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Generosity is a way to express love. And we've been talking about more than just being generous with our money. We've been talking about multiple ways of being generous. And how to, multiple ways of being generous, we, we learned in the first week, let's be generous with our thoughts. So what does generosity with our thoughts look like? When's the last time you thought about what you thought about? I mean, have you, are you generous with your thoughts towards others? Are you generous towards your thoughts to yourself? Some of us have some really tough thinking about ourselves, and some of us have tough thinking about others. And instead of, instead of you know, do, you know, listening to the story that you've made up in your head as to how somebody is, what if we gave somebody the benefit of the doubt? What if we changed the story in our own minds towards somebody else? And what if we are generous with our thoughts? We talked about that in week one. Last week, we talked about taking it a step further. And what if we could be generous with our words? Well, generous with our words is saying, you know, instead of just not saying anything, what if we were to, to be generous with our words and with kindness and, and with, you know, encouragement? And what if we could just, what if we could express and not just hold back? Because sometimes, you know, we will, we will talk. The only time we talk is when it's negative or if, if we, we think we're doing well when we, you know, don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. And so we don't say anything. And then we don't tell people how much we appreciate them. And sometimes we need a little gentle reminder. I don't know if you're like me, but I need a gentle reminder every once in a while to be generous with my words and and to express appreciation, express thankfulness, express these kind of things. So what would happen if we could unleash some thankfulness? So last week we gave a challenge of, of writing, you know, cards and write a handwritten card, at least three cards to, to somebody just saying, you know, thank you or we, I appreciate you or this is what I appreciate about you. How many, how many did that last week? Okay, we got to do this message again, apparently. There's, we need, some of us, we need to be generous. This, it's not over just because last week is not over. I'd encourage you, come on. Let's, let's, if we're going to unleash generosity, if we're going to be the light of the world, let's tell somebody that we appreciate them. Come on. Let's compliment them. Let's tell them what they're doing well. Catch them doing something right and tell them. This week I want to talk about being generous with our time. Now, time, I don't know, have you noticed that time is more valuable than money today? That in many ways we will easily pay for something rather than spending time to do it ourselves? Any, anybody know that? That we would... You know, we would, we would rather pay out extra in order to ha- save a little bit of time. And I, I get it. I understand that. I, you know, I observe that, so, you know, in my own life so much that many times I just rather pay a few extra dollars, whatever, just to save a few minutes of time. And I understand that thinking. And this is how I rationalize it for myself, is I rationalize it for myself, is that, hey, we can always make more money, but you can never make more time. Isn't that right? That, that, I mean, time is kind of one of those expiring commodities. It, you just can't make it up. You can't add hours in the day, which would be nice um, sometimes. Um, but we, we just, we, we view time as, as valuable. But here's the problem with that is, is that time is precious. Yes, time is precious. And, and, you know, all of us today, even though we have devices that are supposed to save us so much time, we have less time than ever. Anybody notice this? That we're busier than ever. So let me ask you this question. What are you giving your time to? And another question I want to answer is, are you setting aside time to be generous in your community? Are you setting aside time to be generous to others who may need you? Are we being generous with our time? Now, we talk about time. Time is not, I mean, I think we've got less time. You know, maybe we're busier than in any generation in the past in multiple different ways. We have this, this fear of being bored. Or let me just, let me, okay, let me be cool for the young people because they're like, they don't get this. It's, it's FOMO. It's, it's fear of missing out. So we're, we're just, we want to, 
we don't want to miss out on anything and we don't want to be bored. And the greatest fear of all is being bored. And we, we just get to this place where we're just, we don't like being bored. And so we make ourselves busy even when we're not. And we, we forget that we're, we're really not taking good use of our, or making good use of our time. Now, time is not, this is not a new problem. This is something that was a problem for thousands of years and a couple thousand years ago. Paul addressed this very same thing to to the church in, in Ephesus. He said this. He said, therefore... See that you walk carefully. He's, he's talking to a bunch of new believers. He says, walk, make sure that you walk carefully. Living life with honor, purpose, and courage. So he's defining, when he says walk carefully, he's defining walking carefully as living life with honor. Well, we learned a couple uh, a weeks ago that living life with honor simply means esteeming everybody else higher than you. That if you're going to live life with honor, you got to honor means I'm going to lift everybody else above me. I'm going to, you know, honor people. I'm going to esteem them higher than me. I'm going to give that to them that I can love myself. And I encourage you to love yourself as much as you possibly can. Only if do two things is, is, you know, give credit and glory to God who made you. And number two is esteem everybody else higher than you. That, and that's living a life with honor. So he says, walk carefully in, in your life. Walk carefully with honor, making sure that you're esteeming everybody else higher than you. Then he says, the next way to walk carefully is with purpose. Now here's the thing with purpose. If you have a pulse, God still has a plan. That nobody is without Purpose. I also believe that if you don't know the purpose of something, you will abuse it. If you don't know the purpose of a, a screwdriver, as a scr- is, is to meant to, is to, is, you, you, know, you know what the purpose of a screwdriver is? I have no idea. My <laughs> wife does all that. But I've been told, so she said this is a great analogy. So here, here we go. Honestly, she fixed everything in that. See, a couple years ago, this is really bunny trails now. A couple years ago, I went to a men's conference and I won a toolkit. And... The, and <laughs> And the guy that gave me the toolkit, Pastor Morris, he, he, he used to be the pastor here before me, he hands me, he hands me the toolkit and he says, it's not fair that your wife wins a gift at a men's conference. Because <laughs> he knew exactly who was going to be using it. <laughs> I brought it home and I said, are these good? <laughs> yeah, how did I get off on that? Anyway. If you don't know the purpose of something, you'll abuse it. If you don't know the purpose of a screwdriver is and you try to use it as a hammer, how many know you're going to abuse the nail and you're going to abuse the screwdriver? So if you don't know the purpose of something, you will abuse it. And many people are abusing time in their lives because they don't know the purpose of their life. So in order to walk carefully, you need to understand, you need to walk in honor, you need to walk with purpose. And if you're saying, well, I'm not sure what my purpose is. Listen, the Holy Spirit that Jesus, that God gave us when you've become a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit wants you, he wants to define, he's more passionate about your purpose. He's there to equip you in your purpose. He wants you to discover your purpose more than you want to discover it. So ask him and find out. But I promise you that purpose is always tied to honor. That purpose is never about esteeming you and elevating you above everybody else. Purpose is always about helping somebody else. And then he says, look at this, walking carefully, walk with courage. I think there's an order in this. Living life with honor, esteeming others, purpose, because that's where I'm going to find my purpose is when I start helping others. And then when I discover my purpose, guess what? You're going to discover that when you see God's purpose for you, that his ways are always higher than your ways. His, his higher ways than your ways are going to scare you. Because you're going to see what God has for you, and you're going to realize, wait a second, I can't do that. I'm not equipped like that. You See, when Moses discovered his purpose, the first thing he says is, I'm not and I can't. Because what God was asking him to do, he wanted done, but he, did, he just didn't think he was able to do it. So he says, I'm not and I'm can't, I can't. And God says, well, wait a second. I am. And I'm with you. We can do this. You're going to need courage. You're going to need the courage to step out. That's living life with honor, purpose, and courage. He goes on and he says this. Verse 15, not as the unwise, 
but as wise. And then he defines wise as sensible, intelligent, discerning people. So he says this. Now look, at the, the dictionary describes wisdom as the soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. Okay, that's the dictionary. Let me break it down into the simplest terms. Solomon says in Proverbs 3 and in Proverbs 4 and all throughout the book of Proverbs, he says, get wisdom, get knowledge, get understanding. Now here's what it is. Whose responsibility is it to get it? Ours. Your wisdom is dependent on you getting it. Now here's what happens. Your wisdom is dependent on you getting knowledge. And if you get knowledge, how do you get knowledge? You learn. How do you get knowledge? You ask others. How do you get knowledge? You read. You fill yourself full of knowledge. Then you get understanding of that knowledge. That's the next step. And if I can get understanding of the knowledge, it's not just good enough to fill my mind full of knowledge. i got to get understanding of the application of that. And once I understand the application of that and begin to apply it, that's wisdom. Wisdom is the application of the knowledge. So this is what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, hey, you need to walk carefully with honor, purpose, and courage, and with wisdom. And so then, he, so then we say, well, how, how, how are we supposed to do this? Because he says he defines wisdom as un, you know, application. You need to do something, application of the knowledge that you received. Then he says this, this is how you apply it, verse 16. He says, making the very most of your Time. In other words, this is how you act out wisdom, is you make the most of your time. Then I like how the Amplified Bible says it. It says, make most of your time on earth. Why is that important? Well, let's just apply that. When you get to heaven, heaven is called eternity. What is there going to be abundance of? Time. So you're not going to have to make the most of it because there's never ending supply of it. So he says you need to make the most of your time here. Why? Because here is when you can honor others. Here is when you have a purpose. Here is when you're going to need courage. When you get to heaven, we're all honoring God. When we're here, we have a purpose. So we make the most of our time on earth. And he says this, recognizing and taking advantage of every opportunity and using it with wisdom, that's applied knowledge and diligence recognizing and taking advantage of every opportunity. What does that look like? Have you ever noticed people that seem to be lucky? Or let's, let's use the Christian term, favored. <laughs> <laughs> right, that everywhere they walk, they seem to have opportunities nobody else has. You know what I've noticed? is that opportunities are available to everyone. There's not somebody who walks around with this extra special, you know, glow or, or the rest of it. You know what the difference is? There's opportunities for everybody. Th those who see it are those who are looking for it. You know what I've also noticed? Is that the generous get more opportunities. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. What does that mean? That means more and more and more opportunities. You know why? Because you start living your life carefully and you start honoring, esteeming others and giving to others. It's amazing how people want to be around and attracted to generous people and how generous people get more opportunities because people know that they're going to use it wisely. Anybody ever notice this? Opportunities. Look at opportunities calling. Look at that. <laughs> amazing. Timing that was perfect. <laughs> how do we watch how do we look for opportunities we have to look for them we have to see them see them so here's here's what i want here's the challenge for this week we're gonna we're gonna create opportunities is that all right you can you can wait for it or you can make them happen so here's the challenge this week i, I want i want you to carve out 30 minutes 
30 minutes this week to find a person or a local cause that you can volunteer your time at. Just 30 minutes. And some of you are thinking, oh, I can't spare the time. No, sometimes you have to make the time. 30 minutes. Can we do 30 minutes? If we could spend 30 minutes this week volunteering and giving our time to somebody, to, a, to somebody who needs help or to a cause, we could do that. And just to make it easier for you, we've provided and we've got sign-up tables in, in the lobby with different opportunities that are coming up that you can invest time in. We've got, you know, Shop of Wonders with My City Care uh, coming up, which, which uh, by the way, we've got an amazing facility downtown that, that, for that, and we can't wait. We've already got how many kids? 600 kids already. How many? 639 kids already signed up for Shop of Wonders. Isn't that amazing? If you're not sure what Shop of Wonders is, that's when we, we turn, a, a, we build a toy store for kids who can't, and for families who can't afford Christmas. And we bring families in one at a time so they, they shop with dignity and, and, and pride. And they shop the toy store for free and they, they, they get these toys and each child gets two, three gifts, and they, each parent, they don't, the parents get gifts as well. And, and all this, I mean, we turn Christmas and we help. Families in need, 639 kids are going to have Christmas that they wouldn't necessarily have Christmas in our community already. And you, you can be a part of it if you give 30 minutes of time, and it would greatly help this week as we set up the toy store. And, and there's other events that we've got going on, other things that are going on, but not just events. I'm not just saying spending events in, in, in our church and what our church is doing. Uh, I'm, what if we were to look at helping Streets Alive and helping the food bank and helping you know, organizations in the town that at this time of year that they need help and they need to volunteer and give time. What would happen, I, I said this in the first service, what would happen if the 2,000 people that attend our church uh, on, at all of our campuses and online, what would happen if the 2,000 people would, would give 30 minutes this week? And I had a young boy come up and says, Pastor Kelly, during that service, I did the math. And I was like, thank you. Because I was trying to do it in my head, and I was like, that's a big number. He says, did, he says Pastor Kelly, you realize that if 2,000 people did that, that would be, we would give, it would be like 1,000 days or more worth of volunteer hours. That doesn't work. It was, that, it was 1,250 hours. Does that work? That doesn't work. <laughs> do the math. Somebody will do it for me and help me out. But we can imagine if we could unleash an unprecedented amount of compassion and generosity in our community, what would we do? Why would we do this? Why, would, why, why Pastor Kelly, you're talking about this, why would we do this? Because Paul said the same thing in verse 16, he gave us the why. He says, because the days are filled with evil. How encouraging. He says, walk with wisdom. He says, walk and, and with wisdom, make the most of your time. Walk carefully, walk with wisdom, make the most of your time. Why? Because the days are filled with evil. Now look at, he's not saying make the most of your time so that you're spared from evil. I believe what Paul's saying is he says make the most of your time because the days are filled with evil. And he's piggybacking on what Jesus said. And, G and if the world is getting darker, and if the world is getting, it, it, you know, is, is, is evil and getting darker, it it, we need to make the most of our time to turn on the light. That if we could unleash the light into our community and make the most of our time and give to others and honor others and esteem others, we'd find our purpose, but we'd be, able to, we'd be able to affect our community. And that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that the series, that we can change some things. Amen? This can take all of us. Many hands make like work. Let's, let's go for it. Let's volunteer somewhere. There's opportunities in the lobby that encourage you to say, okay, I'm going to, how many are going to, this week, I'm gonna, I can carve out 30 minutes this week to help out in some way. See, I, we, we just took a picture there. You had no idea. All the hands are up. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> saying, hey, let's, let's, let's commit to this thing. If we could unleash generosity, we could do some things. Here's today's takeaway. Let's do ordinary things with extraordinary love. Imagine a world 
where people who are skeptical of what we believe would become envious of how well we treat one another and how well we treat them. Imagine, for you, imagine being a person who wakes up every morning with joy and with a sense of purpose because you know you are God's gift to this community. That's what we're supposed to do. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the challenge in there, Jesus, to, to be the salt and to be the light in our communities. I pray that you'd give us the wisdom to know what to do, the courage to be able to do that. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, for those who are uncertain of their purpose, I pray that you'd begin to speak into their, their lives and their hearts about what their purpose is. And even as we begin to volunteer and help others, I pray that there'd be a sense of purpose and understanding of purpose in that, in Jesus' mighty name. Because sometimes we need to give more than people need to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here this morning and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, you got to meet my Jesus. He's the most generous being in all of the universe. He's, he's amazing. He's generous in this way. He's generous with acceptance, with love. He's generous in every stretch of the imagination. Religion says you have to earn God's acceptance. Jesus says, I accept you before you change. And if you don't have a relationship yet with him, I implore you, you've got to meet my Jesus. He's so much more than I can ever advertise or talk about. And all you need to do to begin a relationship with Jesus is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is God. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. So we're going to pray a prayer right now, the most powerful prayer you can possibly pray. It just, it's going to confess that Jesus is God. And if you believe what you're praying is true, right here, right now, you can begin a relationship with Jesus. So let's pray this together. If you're watching online, pray this with me wherever you are. Let's pray this together. Everyone repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God and I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord, my God and Savior. I give my heart to you Thank you for forgiving me all of my sins, for accepting me just as I am. In Jesus' name, amen.